Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today for class here at Sunnyside again. Uh, this is Trevor Cameron, our general manager here, uh, talking to you about maples today, one of my favorite subjects. So say hi to Nicole, she's in the background there. Hi, good morning. Happy rainy day here in Washington after, what, 16 days of sunshine in April, which has never happened. Uh, we had July last week, now we're back to regular April weather, a little drizzle, but uh, I know the gardens and our soil need some moisture, so... I will take it this weekend. But uh, like I said, thanks for joining us. This is always a fun class for me to teach. Uh, probably my first plant addiction was Japanese maples way back in the day. Um, and certainly at Sunnyside here, we specialize in quite a selection of Japanese maples. Hopefully everybody got a copy of the sheet. If I can get it just right. So there's some uh, words of wisdom for you to look at during the class and save for future reference. Uh, it's on our website or certainly email us if you didn't get it we can send you a copy um, i also wanted to mention mention our website if you haven't been on there uh, take a look at the japanese maple page uh, nicole and i spent some serious time in the winter uploading fresh pictures and information on the majority of all the cultivars we carry uh, there's a list on there that will give you all the ones that we that we typically have in the course of the year um, i will say this before we look at a nice slideshow uh, the nursery has been crazy busy, just like it was last year. Um, some things are sold out. We'll try to replace. Uh, we'll do our best we can to, to fulfill your wishes. But uh, the sooner you get down here and get shopping, the better, because you've still got a good selection. Um, but we are running out of plants fast of all kinds, and especially maples as well. So um, having said that, I'm going to start a slideshow here. We're going to show you some fun pictures. And get it to run. All right, I think we're in action here. All right, here we go. So there's me if you forgot my name already. And we are at Sunnyside Nursery here in beautiful Western Washington. So we're gonna start with kind of a funny slide here. And uh, we, we, I coined this term years ago, Acer palmatum itis. So if you know Japanese maples, uh, that's our stock species, Acer palmatum and a cultivar. There's a couple other ones we'll talk about today, but the majority of maples are gonna be in that same genus. Um, if you look at the definition there, hopefully it'll make you chuckle, you know, somewhat contagious me uh, mental condition where gardeners who show extreme addiction to Japanese maples of any kind. Symptoms include having multiple specimens in the landscape, followed by countless pots sighted around the garden and home with maples in them. Explanation you always give to me when you're shopping here is, but I have room for one more. So yes, I'm a member of that club. Yes, I have too many maples, and I'm guessing because you joined us today, you like them too. So if we look at some, some general information, um, you know, if you come down here and go shopping and you'll see the, the amazing amount of choices. I mean, we can find a maple literally for probably every spot in the garden from different forms, different color, spring color, fall color. There's so many different uh, choices we have. Uh, we certainly can find the, the tree that's going to catch your personal taste as a gardener. Um, always pay attention to sun versus shade. You know, any maple on the property I can grow part shade, part sun. We just have to be more careful when we go to the two extremes. If we've got full sun, we want to be careful we pick one that will take the summer heat and not crisp. Um, so we'd still get our fall color. And then of course, if we have deep dark shade, um, we want to be careful which ones we choose. A, that will brighten up a shady area with some cool foliage color, um, but also thrive in those conditions. Um, you know, as a, as a quick example, you know, if I come down here and buy a nice red, fire glow, you know, a pretty easy maple to grow in a small yard. If I put that in total shade, I'll, I'll lose some of the bright red color. It will still grow, it will still thrive. But if you're purchasing that because I want the red, if I have that in a little more sun, I'm gonna have the color that I want. You know, here in Western Washington, you know, I always talk about drainage in a lot of the classes, but in particular with maples, you know, poor drainage is the absolute kiss of death. You know, if you've got a yard where I dig down, and find hard pan clay, a foot in the soil, a foot and a half, and I dig a little shallow hole and I pop a maple in. In the winter time, in our rainy season, when that water table comes up, I'm gonna have issues with maples and inevitably have them crash in my, in my yard. 
So make sure you've got good drainage. We want water going through, especially in the winter time. Um, you know, this time of year, I think a lot of customers are surprised. Just yesterday here at the nursery, beautiful sunshine. I overheard countless people shopping in the maples looking, wow, I can't believe how bright that is right now. A lot of the spring colors are just as pretty as fall. You know, and when I'm choosing a maple for my own yard or a new container, uh, my landscape, you know, I'm looking at three seasons of interest. What do I have for spring color? What does it look like in summer? And then what color does it turn in fall as well? Uh, one thing I always recommend to people is consider mounding up your specimen a little bit. You know, if you think you're going to fight groundwater, it's not the answer. We're not going to plant it on a little anthill, but a nice gentle berm will get that tree up a little bit. A, to me, it will highlight the specimen in the garden but B, give me that little extra added insurance that maybe I am a little bit higher and won't have to worry about the watering quite as much. Um, if we talk planning real quick, you know, always try to dig a hole at least twice as wide and deep, whether I'm buying a container maple or a field grown maple. Um, you know, I always swear by the one third, two thirds rule. If I dig my hole, I have my pile of native soil that I, that I took out, there's my backfill. I want to add about one third compost to that, mix it all up and use that for my backfill. Then I've added some compost, help with drainage, energize the soil with the microbes and the compost. Um, so very easy uh, to do that way. A container grown maple is going to be growing in a little pot since it was created. So you're going to typically find a gallon, two gallon, five gallon, whatever it is. If I slide that maple out, I'm going to have probably a root ball that is growing in a circle. Maybe it's got a little surface roots. There's no issue with that. But I want to take my hori hori knife, the tip of my pruner or something, and score lightly the outside of that ball. I don't want to dig in and rip it apart. Sometimes maybe I chop the bottom inch off if it's, if it's a lot of roots down there. But I just want to loosen it up a little bit and tell that little tree, hey, we've got some fresh soil. Let's get growing in, into, the, into the new dirt. Um, for bald and burlap, and I, I think most people know what, what I mean when I say that, maybe a little larger field specimen. If it's in a burlap sack inside of that pot, um, I never ever want to remove the sack. If, if I take that tree home, <clears throat> I take the sack off, untie it all, take it off, pick it up, and then drop it in my hole, there's a huge chance you're going to crack the root ball and lose the tree. So let's always try to set it in there intact, do all my backfilling. The last thing I would do is cut the twine away from the trunk and either peel that burlap to the sides or take my scissors or a knife and just cut that top little excess off. Now I can slough my mulch over and, and, and we've got happy tree. So just be real careful with all plants, literally bald and burlap. Don't try to take that sack off. It'll rot away very quickly on the bottom and the sides. We just wanna make sure it's off the trunk. Um, always use a good organic starter fertilizer. Again, plant success is all about good health in the soil. And if we plant a specimen, add our compost, do all that, get a little bit of sure start in there, um, which is a great trans organic transplanter from E.B. Stone, that's gonna give me my microbes. That's gonna give my tree some root feeding, some gentle feeding to get it established and get it, get it going in the landscape. Um, and then always mulch, you know, up here, we're so wet this time of year, summertime's awful dry, you know, and if I put a new specimen in, I'm gonna typically fertilize down the hole when I plant it, also on the surface and then mulch over that maybe three foot circle with some compost, bark, whatever you like to kind of lock that food down and keep that tree a little bit happier that first summer or two. You know, there's a couple pictures of the products here. So Planting Compost, DB Stone is a great organic a company that we carry almost all their items. Planting Compost is a great amendment. There's a picture of that Sure Start, great all purpose fertilizer you could really use for just about anything in the garden. Now, if we talk pruning real quick, you know, we'll cover pruning on the course of the seminars I do. We do one in summer coming up here, one in the winter, one in the fall. We'll certainly mention maples of those as well, but inevitably somebody is going to ask about pruning in the question and answer. So I thought we'd attack a little bit of that. Um, you know, if we go back to dormant season, you know, what I look to do in the winter when I have no foliage is remove dead wood and attack structure issues. So whether that's an upright tree, a shrub, whatever, I can very, no, it's very noticeable to see the undergrowth or twigs in the center that have died out. It's not a disease. We don't have a huge issue a lot of times, but your tree is going to look a lot better if I can knock some of that out when it's dormant and then attack the structure, thin it out, 
maybe our branch is uneven, limit up a little bit, any of those reasons, I can do a little bit of that in the winter time. Always get your lace leaf maples during the winter. You're gonna walk out right now and see a big dense, you know, cousin it meatball, red, green, whatever color you have, but you can't look at that tree and see where to prune properly when we have leaves on it. So as long as we can go out on the winter time real quick at some point, December, January, February, it doesn't matter to me, find a nice dry day. A lot of times climb underneath that lace leaf and look up through it. You reach up with your gloves, you can probably snap out most of the old dead wood that needs to be removed. And then I can stand back along the perimeter and look at it and say, you know, again, your taste. Some people want them real twiggy and thick. I like mine more architectural, open a little bit. So you can prune it to your liking by going back after we remove the dead wood and then evening out that structure again on the lace leaf. In the summertime here coming up, you know, everything's leafing out right now. So we're not gonna prune much, but I could walk out later May and June and look at my tree. Is it too thick? Is it leggy? You know, I could dive in there and do some thinning or heading back on the tips of the branches to control the size a little bit. As long as I do it in that early summer time frame, I've got the rest of the summer for to regrow and, and establish some shape. If I talk fertilizing, you know, maples, a lot of people um, ask about feeding maples. So if you, you know, want my trick with Japanese maples, if, if I feed in late winter, um, which again, if you haven't done it, it could be still now, I'm gonna have a big flush of growth. You know, maybe I think back to last year, I'd like my tree to be a little thicker, a little bit more foliage. Maybe I wanna block the neighbor, grow a little faster. If I give it that feeding early in the season, that typically is going to give me a good foliage push. If I go do it again, in that again, that late May, early June time frame, now I'm gonna build caliper. So I'll thicken up the wood a little bit. Maybe last year, your, your problem was the opposite. You walked out here on a rainy day in May, there's so many leaves, the branches were hanging almost to the ground on a tree because of the weight. So if I can go out there and feed it um, in that early summertime, that will help me build branch caliper and get that tree back up a little bit more upright and help me with that second push of growth over the summertime as well. So you can go back and read the notes on feeding there, but because uh, again, the classes are always recorded, but that's a great way to think about feeding. Once a year, twice a year at the most, you shouldn't have to do much more than that. Even in a container, honestly, same, same idea. I go out, I've already fed them all mine, numerous ones in pots at my house here, coming out of winter. If it looks great, I may not do a second feeding because I want slow and steady. I'm not looking for, for fast, okay? You'll see the picture there. You know, I chose the EB Stone uh, Tree and Shrub Food. Big picture of the lace leaf maple right in there. That's a great, all-purpose fertilizer. You can see by the number 722, uh, never burn with organics. There's no chance of that. And I really just need some nitrogen if I want to, again, create some wood um, or some fresh foliage. Just a couple diseases that I would watch for. This is one I fought in my own yard in Everett where I live, but verticillium wilt, you know, we talked about drainage at the beginning. And if my water table comes up in the winter, there's a lot of plants that do not like that water table in the winter attacking the root system. Verticillium is a fungus that lives in everybody's yard. I could go stick a shovel down and find it anywhere in anybody's yard, probably anywhere in Western Washington, but it doesn't attack root systems unless that groundwater table comes up in the winter. Now the fungus infects the roots and then we lose the tree. There's no cure, there's no spray, there's no magic answer for this, except improve your drainage um, or pick another spot, which is what I had to do. Um, you know, it's hard to explain verticillium, but I, I found this picture. And if you look at that section, say my tree died, I'm curious why I saw a good sized branch off, you know, maybe inch and a half or, or larger caliper. You will always see that dark black or dark, dark brown bullseye kind of pattern in the wood. That's the telltale sign that we have verticillium in our soil. You can have a soil test done if you wish. Again, there's no real way to correct it but we just wanna make sure we diagnose it so you don't waste your money. Now, okay, I know I have it in this area. I'm gonna pick a different tree that is not affected by, by verticillium. I went with the dogwood in my own yard. I've been happy with it ever since, but there are some options that won't be affected. Make sure when you prune trees like this, if you're you know curious or wondering what it is or what the issue is, sterilize your pruners. Uh, do not take a chance of sawing this 
oh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And then I go attack a healthy one. You, that's a very easy way to transfer that pathogen from plant to plant to plant. So always sterilize your pruners if you're in question, okay? The other one is Pseudomonas. So this is a coral bark maple, which is very easy to see that black color on the wood. But if I have Pseudomonas, that is something that I can spray for a little bit. A, I would always try to prune it out. You know, if that was my tree at home, I'd be going down to where that branch meets the lower section there. And I'd be lopping that thing right off, crossing my fingers and hoping that it didn't make it into my trunk. If you have black, that is not a good sign on maples. Uh, you know, coral bark is probably the most acceptable to Pseudomonas. Certainly other ones can get it as well. And honestly, a lot of other plants. But if I tend to, to use copper fungicide, if you've got some liquid cop or our copper fungicide from Bonide and sprayed that tree once in the winter, that would help for sure keep that to a minimum. Or if you have it and we prune the black tips out, spray what's left to make sure that we don't have it continue, okay? Now, if we talk maples in pots real quick, you know, there's a lot of good choices. I can grow any plant in a pot I want. The question I would have for you as a gardener, how many years are you looking to do this? And how big is your container? Because a lot of people ask me this every day, which is a great one for pot. The first question is, well, how big is the container you have and where you're going to locate it as far as sun or shade? You know, for me, you know, I, I, I typically stick with a lot of two by two frost proof glazed containers in my yard. If I get a nice, you know, two gallon, even a five gallon maple to enjoy as a container specimen, you know, typically I'm gonna get seven, eight, even 10 years out of a plant like that in a container before I know I have to take it out, um, add it to the yard, root prune it or, or shift it into a larger container. You know, always use um, good well-drained potting soil. For me, I mix the same thing as the ground. I'll take our EB Stone, Edna's Best potting soil, mix a little bit of compost with it as well and use that for my potting mix use some compost on the top for mulch. I feed it like we talked about once a year coming out of winter, but just make sure it's not any kind of moisture control potting soil. I want the water to drain through. I do not want to hold moisture in that container for the same reason that we talked about in the, in the ground soil. Um, I always use pot risers, you know, something I can raise my pot up off a hard surface. Again, I don't want that drain hole to get plugged so I can make sure that water is draining out of the container um, every time I, I irrigate it. Okay, and this is the time of year, you know, if you've got maples and pots, make yourself a note even a month ago, you know, I would, I walked around my yard, took the pot, laid it on its side, feel around the edge. Can I stick my finger in there? Is it root bound? Do I need to maybe do some root pruning and replant it or transfer it into a larger container or the ground? If we check them coming out of winter, um, that's a great time that we can still attack a project like that. If we wait till summer, we find out we're watering every day and the water's going right through because we have nothing but roots left. It's going to be a little tougher transplant, although we would still um, want to take care of it right away. So there's a great picture of the potting soil there, the EB Stone and the Simple Pot Risers. That's a great local company that just takes recycled tires. You got two sizes, they hold an incredible amount of weight, but all my pots are stuck up on those as well. Very cheap option if you're not into pot feed and, and something a little fancier. You don't even know they're there. So I'm gonna show you uh, quite a few maples here and we'll go through kind of fast and furious because they're, they're put quite a few pictures in here for you. Um, I'll try to sell the names twice just to kind of give you an idea. Um, you know, these are some ones that I think will catch your eye and show you the variety of different foliages we have to choose from. It doesn't mean these are my favorites or these are my only ones I like or nothing else is worthwhile. It's nothing like that. It just is kind of a place to start for you to say, wow, I, Maybe you're new to maples and you're seeing all the different options that you have as a gardener uh, for different specimens to plant. So let the tour begin, just so you know, because someone I'm sure will ask in the chat, plant on the left there is one called Autumn Moon. That is a full moon maple with the orange, the red, the yellow. The plant on the right there is a variegated lace leaf called Suisse, so S-U-S-E-I. That's a hard one to find, but usually we come up with a couple every year. So if we start with lace leaves, you know, again, we're talking about our weeping type Japanese maple, more of a shrub really than a tree. You know, it's up to you to tell that little creature what you want it to do. A lot of people come in here and want a dwarf lace leaf. They want a low one, they want a high one. 
it's all on pruning. When you pick out your plant, the branch is always going to be staked up for some height and then fall over. The tree will keep growing on top of itself to create more height. It won't change. If you don't want the height, keep the top clipped a little bit. You can keep a typical lace leaf down in the two, three foot range if you wanted to. If you want the height, you know, let it go up a little bit and you could prune on the sides, maybe keep a little bit narrower. But here's some color options. You know, everybody's got red, everybody's got green. There's nothing wrong with those two. I think every yard uh, should have a red lace leaf maple in it somewhere. But I'm going to try to show you maybe some ones that are in between if you're into some cool colors that maybe aren't just the same as the neighbor has kind of deal. So Baldsmith um, is a great variety. I've <clears throat> been around for years. It's nothing new. But it's one to me with real fine, uh, delicate foliage, very manageable size, but great color. You know, that's a tree... I could walk out in spring, summer, or, or fall, and I'm gonna see a really nice blend of colors. It's never gonna be just green, just red. I'm gonna kind of have those those two colors mixed together um, and very bright in the fall. It's a great fall color one as well. Otto's Dissectum is one of my favorites these days. Uh, we get a lot of these in probably because I buy them and it's one of my favorites, but <coughs> um, I love orange. You know, that's a picture there in spring, not fall. So right now we've got great leaf color in the spring. We get to summer, it's a little green with some more leaf color. And then fall, we go more towards those orange tones. Again, no different than the growth habit, but, it, but just a little different color on the foliage if, if you like it. Red Dragon is probably the, the best dark purple red. I have one in my yard, another great seller here at Sunnyside. Um, red Dragon is one that if I have a lot of heat and I want that deep dark purple red color, Certainly one that one to take a look at. There's other good ones as well, but but Red Dragon's a great example. Uh, Spring Delight is a great example of something green. So maybe I have, you know, it can grow in sun, but part shade or sun or most locations. Um, and I want to have something a little brighter green. You know, typically they're more of that on that limey green or or bright pea green foliage. This one, if you look really close at the picture, I start out at spring with a beautiful red tip on the leaf. Again, to me, just another added season of interest instead of just a green spring, green summer, turns yellow, orange in the fall. Now I've got some added color in the springtime as well. If we look at some, some smaller shrubby maples, you know, a little bit twiggier, a little bit more manageable. Again, you can look on the website on our list and see a lot of options. But this, again, will just show you kind of a few um, of ones I like here and that have been really popular with our customers. You know, Makawa Yatsubusa, you know, to me is the quintessential Japanese maple. It's got the shape, it's got the structure, it's got the color, very manageable in size. I don't know that I've ever seen Makawa as much more than six feet tall, six feet wide. You can prune them how you like. Um, I think a great tree for the ground or frankly, a great container maple too. Um, I can grow those just about anywhere and get some really sweet structure with it. Uh, Candy Kitchen's one I have at my house. Um, I wanted kind of a bushier red one to grow in a large container. It can grow on the ground just as well, but maybe a little bit more heat, a little bit drier location. Um, there's some great red bushy ones, Candy Kitchen and a few others we have that would kind of fit that bill for a manageable size. Um, here's what we call strap leaf or linear lobum type maple. So almost kind of resemble bamboo a little bit. If you like texture, you like the color, something but a little bit different. You can see uh, the one on the right, Koto no Ito, that's what we call the harp string maple. Very fine, delicate, narrow leaves. Got a beautiful little flower there. That's a spring picture. But that'd be a nice one again for a small yard um, or a large container that I would have a very delicate kind of bamboo-y appearance to it um, on a manageable size. The Villa Toronto, same idea, but now you can see I've added in a little bit of color. I don't just want green. I'd like some red and kind of some colors in between there as we go through spring, summer, fall. The really interesting part, I, I chose that picture on purpose because a lot of people call after having one of these for a year and say, what's wrong with my tree? I have two different leaves on it. What you're looking at in that picture is juvenile foliage versus adult foliage. So if I look at this year's growth, my leaves, my leaves will be a little bit larger, a little thicker, a little different. If I look at the older leaves down the center there, much more narrow and strap light. So a lot of those linear lobums, you'll get the two kind of two size foliage, which again, I think is pretty cool and a little different in the yard. 
Uh, here's a couple more shrubby ones. Uh, Tsukusha gata, um, to me, is a totally different color. If you look at that leaf, it's not washed out. We would call that kind of a chocolate red. It's not crimson red. It's it's certainly not dead looking brown. It's kind of halfway in between. And I think a really cool color for a lot of yards. Uh, Tsukusha gata gets a nice low, kind of broad, shrubby shape to it. It's not a huge plant at all. And again, something I could grow if I had a little room for spread in a pot or a nice landscape without getting a, a huge amount of height out of it. Uh, Sumagaki, we still got a few of these. This is one of the best spring maples. It looks good in the summer and turns great color fall, but that's a spring picture. Uh, that one we we translate as Americans, believe it or not. It, it, it's little girl with red painted fingernail. And if you look at that leaf, it's exactly what the Japanese meant. We have a, took a little red fingernail polish and we edged all those lime green foliage in the spring of a very striking tree for spring color. A couple more, uh, Mikazuki is one we call the, the, the crescent moon maple. It's got a very different shape to it. You can see by that leaf, almost like a claw. Um, very cool color. Mikazuki is one we would get a lot of variegation or what we call reticulation in the foliage. I could have that in some sun, some shade, and it would totally different, uh, totally change the, the foliage colors a little bit differently depending on the light that I get. It's not a huge tree. Um, I think one of the good variegated ones or articulated ones that you could use in a small yard, part sun, part shade is ideal. You'll get, get some cool foliage color on that. Uh, Benny Hashi is one the Americans call the Ruby Stars Maple. Uh, you'll find that. Uh, we've got a few, we'll have some more coming in here too. Uh, that's a great dwarf red one. That's a great one for a pot. It'll take some sun or, again, a small little structure kind of shrubby tree. It's not going to overpower, you know, a smaller yard again. Uh, Akane, we have plenty because, again, I love orange. So Akane, that is a spring foliage picture, believe it or not. Uh, they are glowing orange right now with that yellow center. We would turn that color as well in fall and be green in the summer in between with a little bit of orange on the tips. Um, that's a, a kind of a twiggy shrub. That's not gonna get super big. You know, old Akane maples, you could probably prune and keep in the six, eight foot, you know, kind of range. They are bushy. Certainly pruning would help with that a little bit, but it's, it's gonna look a, a very nice spring specimen with the color. Uh, the picture on the right there, I got at a friend of mine's yard because I got him one years ago. Uh, but this is a really cool maple called Reusin or reuse side that's totally different. This isn't a lace leaf, it is it is weeping, but it's different than a lace leaf maple. You can see what we did is train that thing over an arbor. It almost looks like a vine, although it's not. Um, that's one that would have great fall color. It's green during the season, but literally you could take branches and train and do whatever you want to a reuse. And it's a very cool, uh, to me, kind of artsy maple. You could do something a little different with. Uh, Rhode Island Red is a great seller here. Um, I have one in a big pot here at the nursery as a demo if you want to look at it. But it's, again, a, a shorter, shrubbier tree. That's a perfect picture with Mount Hood in the background even uh, down at Isley Nursery where we get these from. Uh, this is a little tree that would grow slow and steady, maybe reach, you know, 10 by 10 down the road. Um, likes a little bit drier, so maybe one that you won't have to water quite as much. Uh, Murasaki or Kiyohime maple, that's a spring picture. So I would have all kinds of red tip on green. It's a really small foliage, which is a cool texture. Um, and one that I would get a very flat, you know, kind of broad shrubby shape too. That one would never really get a leader and turn into a tree tree. It would be more of a shrub maple to add a little bit of interest into, into a nice sunny garden. Now, if we get into some larger growers, you know, if we talk red for a minute, you know, we have so much green here in Western Washington. I think it's always nice to, to pop a red foliage tree in the yard. It looks great with all the green contrast we have native around here. Um, if we look at red, fire glow on the left would be our stock uh, smaller red maple. So if I want a red maple, spring, summer, scarlet in the fall, but I don't want a huge tree, fire glow is the way to go. You know, you get an old fire glow, I might get into that 12, maybe 15 foot tall and wide range, which isn't super huge for a tree, very manageable with pruning and a manageable small yard tree. 
If for the one in the middle I would have put in, we would add Emperor 1. Now I want to be up there in that 15, maybe 20 foot range, and I like that same color and shape. The top end would be blood good. You know, I want a big, almost shade Japanese maple for the front yard or a larger yard, or I want a 25, you know, maybe even 30 feet by 30 feet on an old specimen. I want a big tree that I can even prune up and have a nice shade tree in my yard with something like blood good. There's a picture of the coral bark, you know, Sengu Kaku is, is the traditional coral bark maple. It is a big plant. I think a lot of people think that coral bark maple, they can get the chainsaw on the stick and keep like a little six foot tree by their driveway. If chainsaw on the stick's your thing, I, I won't persecute you, but coral bark maple will get 25 feet, 25 by 25 or so. That's a big tree. There are dwarf ones around. If you want to get something smaller, I hate to say I'll tell you right now at Sunnyside we are lacking we got zeroed out on most all the dwarf coral barks this year we have a few Benikawa which would cut my heights down a little bit to 15 feet we'll find them eventually but typically we would have winter flame and Aka Kawa Hime I won't spell that because it'll take too long but you'll see it on our list those are two really good dwarf more shrubby coral barks that typically we do have around here to sell um, I added Sherwood Flame there on the right because um, I have some people that want, you know, to me kind of a property line Japanese maple. It'll take a lot of sun. It'll take heat. It's a big grower, but you can see the differences. I have very low horizontal branching. So maybe I'd like a little privacy from my neighbor and I'd like to have a maple tree out there on the, on the perimeter that won't get up into a vase shape that will stay very full with horizontal branching. Sherwood Flames got great color and structure. That's a great, nice, broad uh, specimen Japanese maple. Uh, if, that, if I want to talk fall color for a minute, you'll see on our list all of them listed. But if you're like me and you like a particular fall color, uh, Hogioku, there's some other ones around. If I want pumpkin orange, you know, that's a green tree all season that would turn a really good pumpkin orange, a little bit of gold in the fall. Well, Zakazuki is an old school one straight from Osaka, Japan. If I'm looking to get red, that would be on the top of the five fall color red trees around. Ozakazuki is a big grower that would have spectacular red color in the fall. Uh, a few more different kind of upright ones. Uh, Summer gold is one we do have around. Um, I like the foliage color again. If you look at that picture, that's spring. So I would leave out with a really nice yellowy tone foliage it would hold that yellowy lime green color all through the summer and then I would turn color for fall. So maybe if I want a larger grower, it would give me more of that yellow to lime color. Um, summer gold may be one to choose. That one will take some good heat. It doesn't need to be in total shade, um, but the, maybe the right amount of sun will give you that right amount of yellow on it. Uh, Pung Kiel is a newer one with again, more of a red strap leaf, but that one would get a little bigger. Uh, we tend to have a few of these around as well. If you like that finer linear lobum type texture again, but I like the, the red color. Uh, Katsura and Orange Dream, you know, both those pictures are spring, not fall. I'll start with that. So Katsura is one that if I want a big, you know, 25 foot by 25 foot tree, I love the orange spring color, nice crisp green in the summer, and then turn orangey red in the fall. Katsura makes a beautiful specimen if you're looking for a bit, bit larger one with some spring color. Orange Dream would kind of be the half version of that. I've tried this one a couple times over the years. It's a great grower, but don't put it out in afternoon sun. Orange Dream will glow if you've got that part sun, part shade or morning sun location. I wouldn't recommend it for afternoon sun. It'll get a little, little crispy, a little tired when we get to August in the heat of the summer. Uh, Toby Osho is one of our best fall color sellers. Um, that's an exclusive from uh, Isley that they found in their own seedling garden. Uh, you can see a big seedling type maple, you know, 25 feet by 25 feet. It's got a great green color all season long and spectacular in the fall. So if I want a big round crown, specimen maple, Toby Osho would be one uh, definitely worth taking a look at. Now the one on the right there, you're probably thinking, what did he put that picture up for? 
Um, if I look at Toby Osho, I would literally have the same shape, more red in the fall as that picture I put of Toby Osho on there. The Arakawa is what we call rough bark maple. So that's a picture of the bark that looks like a pine tree. In Japan, they would literally plant that for bark interest. It's got great leaves, awesome fall color. But in the wintertime, I would look out and see that interesting uh, corky bark on it that looks literally more like a pine tree than a, than a Japanese maple. You know, here's a great example of one, um, you know, we started out, I, I mentioned, I'm always looking for trees with multiple seasons of interest. That's why we call this, this class, the tree for all seasons. I mean, how poetic is that? So if, if I look at Shindus Hojo as an example here, this is another one we tend to sell a lot of. I've got a totally different tree in the spring, the picture on the left. I've got a lightly variegated tree in the summer and then I go over to the fall and I turn a different color. So as not a huge, huge grower, um, we've got a nice little kind of mini specimen tree that I would really get three distinct foliages out of on a, on a nice selection like, like Shindus Hojo. Here's our lion's head maple. You know, we call this Shishigashira is the female lion in, in Japanese mythology. So this is what traditionally folks ask for when they want lion's head or lion's mane maple. We also get a few ojishi, you know, O-J-I-S-H-I, -I, you'll see that on the list. That's the male form. It's a little bit harder to come by. They're both great growers, but certainly for a specimen, uh, the shishigashira would be the way to choose. That's a great picture there. Again, I'm out there in spring with a nice crisp green turning beautiful color in the fall. And it's an, another kind of, you know, clumpy grower a little bit. It's got a different growth habit. If you haven't seen lion's head, take a peek at them. I think they're a really interesting uh, variety of Japanese maple. Uh, here's one I have in my yard, the Twombly's Red Sentinel. Uh, that's a popular seller around here. If we want something maybe just a little bit narrower, this is one that we would grow a little bit more upright with and have a really nice red color, beautiful scarlet in the fall. Uh, we do have a few larger ones of these left around. This is another one we'll get more in the summer and for fall planting as well. Uh, Kamagata um, is another one of me that I think covers all, checks all the boxes across the board. We would call this the Eagle Claw Maple in America, but Kamagata has got great structure, slow growth rate, an interesting foliage, a little bit more hanging, kind of like the Eagle Claw. Um, we do have some of these around now. This is a great one I could even grow in a container for some time and transplant out into my yard later because it is a little bit of a, of a slower grower. Now, if we look at, you know, we started this off, hopefully you chuckled when you saw my Acer palmata mitis slide. You know, that's our main uh, genus and species of Japanese maple, of maple, Acer palmatum, lots of different cultivars. If we look at some other options that are just as, as equally uh, brilliant in the landscape, the, the full moon maples are another couple different species. So we have Acer japonicum, you can see on the right, the tongue twister, Shira wasawanum on the left. You don't have to spell that or say it, um, but that's those are two other species that we'll see in the yard. We carry a number of different varieties in both of those. They're just a little bit different trees. The golden full moon maple, um, if you've got shade, no afternoon sun and want a, a specimen tree, nothing will beat the color of that. I mean, that is a glowing lime gold color all through the season and spectacular colors in the fall. Um, that's a, a true specimen tree for a shade garden. Afternoon sun, you're gonna get tired in August. It's gonna get a little brown, won't ever kill the tree, but it's not gonna look very crisp when we get towards fall color. The japonicum, some people call it dancing peacock maple. There's a full, you know, uh, there's a, a bunch of different names for japonicum maples. But basically we have a larger leaf <coughs> with that dissected foliage, almost like a little, a little bit like a, 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 you know, a peacock, a little bit. The, the colors in the fall is where I'm gonna get orange, yellow, red, purple, and most colors in between. So depending on the variety I choose, I can have a different leaf size, but always gonna have spectacular multiple colors when we get towards fall color. Um, and a pretty good strong grower. Those, those have a, a nice tree shape to them. I have one in my yard called Ed Wood. I wanted huge leaves. Um, Ed Wood is one to look up if you like a monster foliage, almost tropical size leaf, but that would be a variety of, of Acer japonicum. 
a few maples for shade. I'm getting close here. Um, you know, here's a couple for springtime uh, with the color out. Coral Magic um, has got that beautiful colored leaf here in springtime. That's not a big grower. You can see that on the list. Uh, Manuel Osato to me is totally unique. We're still waiting for a few of these, so don't ask yet. We will come up with some, but I don't have anything else with this color. That is literally what it looks like, a purple-red color with lime green variegation. If you can find a, a nice specimen of Manuel Osato, that is a totally unique color on the maple world. Uh, some variegated stuff for shade. Uh, radiant, uh, there's a lot of variegated options out there, but if I like pink and white and green, I don't think you're going to beat Radiant uh, for an option. We do have quite a few of those this year. No afternoon sun again. I want shade or that morning sun only. Uh, Ukigumo is an old school one we, we call floating cloud maple uh, in America. That would give me a lot of white. You know, that's a great specimen if you've got deep, dark shade and you really want to brighten up a corner with with a foliage with all the white on that it literally glows if you've got it in the right spot that's that's another great choice um akashigatatsu sawa we won't make you say that three times either um, but that to me is a great picture of what what i mentioned the word earlier reticulation in maple world that's our variegation if i look at that leaf i can see all the veins different colors contrasting, some pink, some white, some light green, some dark green. Again, if I've got that morning sun uh, to, that I want to brighten up with a really cool color, um, look at the reticulated maples like, like Akash, Akash Shigatatsu Sawa. Uh, Shiraz, <coughs> or Shiraz, is a present from our, our friends down in the, the Australia, from the land down under. So, down in Australia, they would call this Gwen's Rose Delight. I've seen it listed up here as that as well, but we would call it the Shiraz Maple. Um, this one I actually don't have to have in total shade. I can have sun, shade, really anywhere in between, but it would change my leaf color. So in shade, I'm going to have this green with a lot of white and pink edges on it. If I had that in sun, I would have much more red in the leaf as a base color with a hotter pink and, a, and less white going for the variegation. Purple Ghost is one I have in my yard in sun, so I don't have to have that one in shade again, but Purple Ghost would be a good example of a purple reticulated type maple um, where I've got that color contrast between that dark, bright kind of fuchsia pinky red with the purple, and mine looks great all year long. I've got a big old 20 year old specimen I put in my backyard. It's one of my favorites on, in my own landscape. Uh, really, you can see the commonality here. Purple ghost, their sister ghost, grandma ghost, uncle ghost, baby ghost, first ghost. We could go on and on with this ghost series. Um, there's some excellent choices in that, that series to look at for your yard, but look at the colors and the sizes because there's a nice variation um, in a lot of those little reticulated or variegated uh, ghost series maples. Uh, here's another one of my personal favorites, the Njumai Sunago. We call this in Japan the sand sprinkled maple. If you look at that color, it kind of again has that different chocolate red color um, with the green bark, a really nice foliage maple. And it really looks like I took a little light green paintbrush and just flecked little specks on top of that uh, for light variegation. Beautiful orangey red in the fall as well. Um, to me, that's a great choice for a, a really cool foliage maple that I would have in that, again, morning sun, a little bit afternoon shade um, for a great, great, great color. Uh, Bihu, uh, we'll have some more of these here as we get towards summer, but this one uh, is one that we would have yellow bark, kind of like the coral bark maples, and then a stunning yellow fall color. So to me, one that, again, green, in the spring, summer, gold, fall, and then a really nice bark color if you want to add a little bit of winter interest. This one's a great container choice again if you've got mostly shade or we can use it as a small landscape tree in that morning sun, again, after afternoon shade location. A couple finished ones here, the Pacific Rim collection I wanted to mention. You know, this is one we do carry, uh, I think all the members of this now, this is a, a, you can find information on this on our website or at Isley Nursery, a wholesale place uh, that we buy these from. This is a private 
uh, collection introduced by them. They've taken Acer palmatum and crossed this with Acer saboldianum or Korean maple and spent 20 years playing with seeds and crossing for colors and different growth habits. There's some excellent choices in this uh, variety that the, the main thing you should know is hardier. So maybe you're not in eastern, in western Washington. I could grow this in, in eastern Washington, some of the Midwest areas uh, in much colder climates with that Korean maple as part of the parentage. They look like Japanese maples, they smell like Japanese maples, but they are a nice hybrid maple that does offer a, a little bit more attributes. Ice dragon would be the lace leaf. You know, I want a big mounding flowing specimen that might reach eight or nine feet. Ice dragon's a great choice. That's a really cool tree. We've, we've got a, a nice inventory of those in this year. Cascadia is the latest introduction. We've sold a couple already. I got a couple left. We will get more of these through the summer and fall. But this is one that doesn't weep like a lace leaf. You can see by the close up, it has a dissected foliage to it, but I'm not going to weep. I'm going to have that low, broad, uh, shrubby shape with uh, excellent orange color in the fall. First flame, we're just about out of because, as you can tell by the name, it is first in the spring and it is a flaming color. That's a spring picture, not a fall picture, um, where I've got really nice red orange. A foliage on that creature for spring, green in the summer, and then spectacular fall color again. That's a large uh, specimen grower, a little bit bigger grower for landscapes. Final fire, we just got some more in. And again, a, a decent spring color maple, but again, mostly green during the summer, but towards the top of the list for fall color. That's a great one for a nice specimen Japanese maple with spectacular fall colors. So that'll give you a maple run through. There was a lot in there. If you make note of it again, these classes are always recorded. Um, so you can go back and check on some pictures and some names if you like. Um, there's our contact information. Our website, as I mentioned earlier, has got great maple pictures, great information on almost all the ones we carry. Our list is, is accessible on there as well if you want to see what we typically try to carry through the course of a gardening season uh, and as well as the class handout. Uh, email us. Let me stop that. Email us if you like. Our email address is right there. I'm almost always here, especially in spring. We have lots of good staff that can help you answer questions um, and certainly get you steered in the right direction. So with that, don't seem to be able to escape. Let's stop share here. There we go. It worked. Um, I just want to mention a couple more things and then we're going to do some questions. Um, tomorrow is Colorful Climbers Day, so if you want to learn about vines with me, I'll be doing a slideshow and we'll be talking creepy, crawly, clingy creatures like vines at 11 a.m. for Sunday. So we'll have that for tomorrow. Um, I wanted to make a plug for next weekend because um, I'm a rhododendron lover among many other plants, and I think a lot of other gardeners are up here as well. It's our state flower. It's a perfect shrub for spring bloom. We have an unbelievable selection of roadies around here. And next Saturday, the 1st of May, is our rhododendron seminar. So I'll be here talking rhododendrons at 10 a.m. And if you can come down, that's a great day to visit us. We'll have a sale going on roadies. But we'll also have special guests here, the Pilchuck chapter of the American Rhododendron Society. We have them down every spring. They've got great gallon collector rhododendron plants we'll be selling to help, I uh, hope, out their charity and they will have a truss show here. So literally you can come down and look at monster rhododendron flowers of things that I see I've never seen every year. These are people that, that grow collector roadies and do breeding on their own to show you some very cool, unique plants, as well as some of the, the common ones we would see in gardens as well. So, so consider joining us again tomorrow for vines. And next Saturday, the 1st of May, we'll be doing our rhododendron azalea uh, kind of weekend going for spring bloom all through, okay? So with the class here, before we do questions, we always have a great discount for our loyal customers that, that come down here and shop. So you can probably guess it's Japanese Maple Day. So guess what's on sale? Starting today through Friday, Japanese maple's all 20% off. So uh, I would recommend coming down earlier than later for best selection. This is usually a popular week for maple purchases. Uh, but we do have a pretty good inventory of a lot of good ones I've shown you today, as well as a bunch of other good ones 
uh, that I could not make this seminar two hours or I would have shown you more. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole here and we are going to get some questions in. Lots of good information. Um, we talked a lot about uh, the handout, I think is always really helpful in that list. I know a lot of people were talking about that's up on our website. I threw the direct link in the um, chat as well, but it's up on our Japanese Maple page and there's lots of different breakout pages. So you can see pictures of all the things he talked about and lots of other varieties too. So um, Trevor, can you talk a little bit more about watering needs for yep. both uh, established and new plantings? Well, I think again, if, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak Western Washington because that's what we're hopefully helping most of you. Um, if you ask me, I think we get enough rain, you know, starting in fall this year, April, we would, I had to go water my yard last week. Um, but typically we're okay until we get into to spring, spring, May, where I'm not having to water a lot of specimens in the ground. Again, drainage is a must. You've got enough groundwater, you've got enough soil moisture here coming out of winter that should get you into that mid late spring time frame. You know, on a new plant, you know, properly mulched, fed, all the things I talked about earlier, you know, I would check my new trees probably two, maybe three times a week in the heat of the summer. That should be plenty. I would rather have you go out and soak the tree less often, encourage a deeper root system and not go out and bless it every day. If you go out and, oh, let me just get the top soil wet. It'll always look like it's water, but we're not gonna have any deep root system. Um, so on the ground, you know, again, not knowing your soil and the sun and the shade and all that, I, I would at least check it twice a week in the summer, maybe three times if it's a young one or, or in a hot spot. In a container, maybe a little bit different, you know, depending on, again, how large your pot is, if it's in sun, if it's in shade. You know, I'm not watering it every day ever, but I'm probably checking it, you know, every other day. I would give it the two knuckle test is what I do if I'm out in my yard or in a pot. I'm gonna stick my big old finger in there and if I feel dry down a couple knuckles, it's time to give it a drink. I think a lot of people, especially in pots, look at the container, the top of the soil is crusty dry, but man, I go down there an inch and I've got plenty of moisture still. Again, the worst thing to do would be to overwater, um, especially in a pot. I wanna let it kind of not dry out, but I wanna make sure I'm, I'm not overwatering by doing it every day. Gotcha. Um, we talked about diseases that tend to typically get maples, and you talked about sterilizing your pruners. What yep. do you recommend sterilizing them with? How do you clean them? You know, to, you know, for me, I, I use rubbing alcohol. You know, if I've got a little jar on my workbench in the garage, put some on a rag, wipe them down real quick. Um, just anything that will sterilize any kind of pathogens, pathogens that might be on the blades. And you talked about anthracnose. If there was um, a maple that was planted near a dogwood that had anthracnose or one that had it and was removed from that area, can that also contaminate your maple too? It, it really can. And I, I don't want to get into, you know, anthracnose is honestly a disease that perhaps may get on every type of foliage tree that's around. I mean, it's not a, the end of the world. It's not the plague, but there's dogwood anthracnose and there's maple anthracnose. So I'm never gonna have my dogwood tree infect my maple, my maple infect my dogwood, if that makes sense. Uh, we certainly would kind of use the same sprays to some extent and certainly the same process to, to help cure it. Um, but typically maple anthracnose doesn't come every year. It's to me a lot more, a lot of times more on shade type maples than it would be on Japanese maples. But something, if it was, if it was on my tree, I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't worry about it that season. It, it, what's done is done, but I would make sure I would go out that fall. I don't want any of those leaves sitting on the ground that winter. And then I probably apply a dormant spray and I'm done with it. You know, I make sure I start that next year clean. Gotcha. Um, what about, we've talked a lot about that maples can go in containers, but how do yep. you choose the right container for the right tree? How do you know if it's big enough? What do you do? Well, again, ask, you know, asking me or our staff here will give you a, a great idea, but, you know, I mentioned for me, you know, I'm, you know, some people, again, you like the, I've got some customers that have pots this big and that big and that big and up and up, and they just keep moving things around. That's fine. Um, when I'm doing one in a pot, I want six, seven, eight, maybe 10 years out of it before I have to move it into the ground, donate it to a friend of the Arboretum um, or plant it, you know, plant it somewhere in a neighbor's house. I mean, I'm, I'm out of room for trees in my place, so we do pots. Um, you know, two by two to me is a great size. If I get a good frost proof container, 
I don't have to worry about cracking. It's not going to get damaged year after year. I can take the tree out. I can put a new one in it. I can keep recycling it year after year. But two by two is probably going to get you quite a bit of time if we get something that just doesn't grow so fast. You know, we talked about feeding and just one time spring. I want slow and steady. I'm not going to go buy, you know, a 10 gallon maple and slip it into a, you know, 15 inch pot. It's going to last a year or two and I got to do something with it. I want to get a, a two gallon, maybe a five gallon in a large container that's got some room to grow and develop. I don't want filler. I don't, I want soil all the way to the bottom. So it's got all that extra root space so that I can get the, the longest life out of it. But, you know, again, to answer your question, if you came down here, uh, the questions I would ask you would be, how much sun is it gonna get? You know, what pot are you thinking? Do you have one, bring it with you? Or we have our pots on here, half price, all of our good outdoor stuff. Let's get the right size pot, get the right tree for the location, and then be honest, you know, hey, I don't wanna mess with this for five years. I wanna plant it there, enjoy it. I don't want to worry about getting root bound or transplanting. Well, sweet, let's, let's get the right tree in the right pot for that. And how do you determine how much fertilizer you need for one that's in a container like that? Well, again, for organic, um, I only use organic foods and it's the basis of what we sell here at Sunnyside. Um, there's no chance of ever burning. So I'll admit, I could look at the package and it would tell me to get two tablespoons and do this. I'm more like, how about a small handful but sprinkle that around on the surface, water it in, and then I'll put just a little bit of fresh compost as a mulch on top of my containers. That's what I do every year. And you mentioned transplanting. Is now a good time to do that? Did we miss that window? When do you do it? Yeah, you know, you know again, um, we really have missed the window to be brutally honest. You're always gonna have, you know, near 100% success. If I do this while the plant is dormant, it's, it's gonna be okay. Um, if it's leafing out, I absolutely wouldn't do it right now. Maybe you can get away with the container to the ground. That's easy. You know, after it's in full leaf, um, I think you can successfully do that. But if I'm going to take and dig up a specimen in my yard and try to relocate it, I would really try to talk you out of doing that, you know, Thanksgiving to first of March, you know, in that dormant season where we'll have success. Excellent. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit more about uh, root pruning? I think you covered that a little bit. Can you go into a little bit more detail on how exactly? Well, I, I think, again, they're talking about probably more container maples. And, and let's just say I have a container maple. I pull it out of my container to check it in the late winter. Um, and I'm looking at nothing but roots around the outside. And it's pretty firm on the surface. Yes, I probably either need to transplant it to a larger container put it in my yard by roughing it up and planting it, or if I, I gotta go back to the same one, well then I'm gonna carefully go along the edge. I'm not gonna rip it apart. I'm not gonna dig in six inches, but maybe I can get in there and kind of prune off the outside two inches all the way around and some off the bottom, loosen it up a bit and I could plant it back in that same container again. Gotcha. Um, somebody asked if you can plant maples under the drip line of pipes. Under the drip line of, sorry, the rain just started hammering oh. here and I can't hear. <laughs> well, that's good because I misspoke, of pines. Pines? Under pines? pines? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, maple makes a great understory tree, so I wouldn't avoid planting it underneath big, tall evergreens, fir, pines, whatever it is. Cedars, I would be a little bit more careful with, to be honest with you. Uh, but those other ones, as long as I can water it um, and keep it happy, I'm okay planting it underneath the, un, as an understory tree for sure. Do you ever find the Japanese maples uh, that deers get after them, or do uh -oh, they, I lost are you. they? Oh, I know the rain's pretty intense. Can you hear me? I lost. I lost you after two words. Try it again. Okay. Do you ever find that um, deers bother Japanese maples? Are they resistant? Is that something we should be worried about? Well, deer, maple wouldn't be on the deer, deer approved or deer immune list. I don't know that they'd be the first thing they'd want to browse in your yard, to, to be honest with you, but I couldn't promise you the deer wouldn't wouldn't help you prune it a little bit. <laughs> Fair. Um, so we, I think we've hit most of the questions. Um, there's one that just popped up about, you know, if you don't have a tag on one that's in your yard um, and you don't know what variety, 
variety it is. Send us some pictures. Um, Trevor loves Japanese maples and he's an expert in them. So he can usually tell you what you've got if you don't know. <laughs> so send us an email with those pictures, Miss Sandy, and we'll we'll do our best to identify that for you. Um, same thing goes, you know, if there's any questions that pop up while you're out looking for maples, um, after the class, when you're planting, whatever, you know, we're here to help. So reach out to us, email or phone, and we're we're happy to help and whatever's going on. Um, we really appreciate everybody joining with us. Um, we Look at us. We landed right before 11 o'clock. Nice job. I know, right? Um, <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow for our Colorful Climbers class. It starts at 11 Pacific Standard Time, so hopefully we'll see you. Enjoy the weather. If you're up here like us, uh, stay out of the rain, stay dry, <laughs> and um, we'll see you all tomorrow. All right. Enjoy the day, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>